Hello and welcome to episode 53 of Hitting the Bar, the football podcast. I'm Chris Carl. And I'm Jeff Saunders. Okay, Jeff, we've got a, a so-called trophy to talk about that happened last week and a lot more as well. But first of all, your trivia question. Okay, it's so a, a long one this time. Lots of clubs have statues of ex-players and managers outside their, their stadium. And for just looking at managers, there's Bob Stoker at Sunderland, Brian Clough, Peter Taylor at Derby, Bobby Robson at Ipswich and Newcastle, Alf Ramsey at Ipswich, Herbert Chapman at the Wanderers, Matt Busby and Alex Ferguson at uh, Old Trafford, Jimmy Hill at Coventry, Bill Shankly at Liverpool and John King at Tranmere. But has a club ever built a statue in tribute to somebody who has never played for them or managed them? And I'm excluding the paedophile at Fulham from this... <laughs> Uh, so we're talking about somebody who's involved in football. Intriguing. All right. You and I, Jeff, uh, sat through the Community Shield, or the Charity Shield as it used to be called, the opener for the season. Arsenal won on penalties. Does it matter? But my opinion is that really, OK, they've won a trophy. Arsenal fans have been gloating about it, mentioning Tottenham throughout. I don't know why. Does it really matter? I don't, I'm not sure it does. No, I agree 100%. If, if anyone says it does matter, then ask them what happened in last season's Charity Shield. And, <laughs> and you know... Can anybody tell you the answer without Googling? Um, here's a question for you. Who won? Who has won four of the last seven Community Shields? Well, as you say, I mean, I can't remember who won last last year, so I've no idea. The Wanderers, believe it or not. Yeah, I, I didn't know and, until I looked it up. So it's, it's a completely meaningless thing. You can't say it's a trophy because it's only two teams involved. And unless we unless remember why, why it, it was the FA and the, the Football League getting together to raise money for charity, a match to raise money for charity, and that's fine. But let's not pretend it's actually a trophy it's not of any great um, shakes or importance obviously Arsenal fans are having a field day saying you know they've now won two trophies in 20 days Tottenham haven't won any in 20 years I wish they just enjoy their enjoy their trophy uh, without having to have a pop at Tottenham I mean they're just kind of unnaturally obsessed I think if Tottenham had won the trophy they'd just enjoy it there is that thing isn't there that whoever 90% of the time whoever wins the charity shield or the community shield goes on to win the league that season sort of traditional it was what people used to say, but I think this year that will not happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't. I don't think we, either of us think it's uh, particularly a great achievement. Arsenal fans are saying, "Look at us now, we've turned the corner." Well, then they're being very foolish, aren't they? Because you you cannot you cannot say one match shows that you've turned the corner. Okay, they they have actually had three matches in a row where they've they played quite well. Two where they played very well, and one where they were okay. I think the most important thing to take away from that match was was to have watched Klopp. Klopp was not his usual walking around, waving his arms around, shouting, getting... He was strolling around, smiling. Even after Obama Yang's goal, he was—he just smiled at it. He—he he really didn't care. He'd put the young lad Nico Williamson, I think, out as as a right back to see how he compares to Ta Squared. And he—he di he didn't get close to Obama Yang when he received the ball. He stood off him, gave Obama Yang the space to take the shot, and Obama Yang said thanks very much. And it was good enough to be the best goalkeeper in the world. Great goal, well done, Obama Yang. But let's not pretend it matters just look at Klopp he was smiling all the way through it and really didn't care in the penalty shootout he put on a sub to take a penalty who hadn't even kicked the ball in the match so no no it doesn't mean anything at all there were periods where Arsenal looked quite good playing through the press there's no question of that the, the young lad Sacco looked good but he always looks good going forward but he doesn't do anything coming back and and he faded from this match the same as he fades from every match so yeah I, I think th th there are signs of a recovery there and signs that they could be good but there's there was nothing there to suggest that they could they could even challenge for six I'd, I'd be amazed if they got si up to the sixth this season yes as much as it pains me to say as a Tottenham fan I have to say the last yeah, three matches, I suppose, the semi-final of the FA Cup, the FA Cup, and this Community Shield. Arsenal have looked a lot more organised and a lot more positive. One thing I did take away from it, although, yes, all right, it doesn't matter. Obama Yang looked absolutely delighted to have won that. He had a great game. Fantastic goal. Beautiful, beautiful goal. Uh, but he did look very pleased, and I think that might be a sign that he is staying, which is not good news for any of us, is it? Well, I mean, in, in, in one sense, it's good news, isn't it? Because it's we, we get to see a great player, and, and he's a really, really good player so 
fine. It's going to cost Arsenal a quarter of a million pounds a week to pay him at, at his age. So uh, I guess it's for them it's a good deal because they couldn't buy anyone else as good as him for the the money they'd get if they sold him. But it's not doesn't solve a longer term problem. It's a short term fix. Gabriel Magalis that they brought in. The newspapers are all saying, oh, he's one of the highest rated defenders in Europe. Well, nobody had heard of him four weeks ago, so. You know, that's a load of nonsense. He might turn out to be a good buy. We don't know. There's still a lot to do at uh, the Wanderers, I think. The lesson that we can take from the last few weeks is look at Gnabry and Coman playing for Bayern Bayern Munich in the final of the Champions League. Both players that Arsenal tried to sign and didn't sign because they wouldn't offer enough money for them. And they end up playing the Champions League final and Arsenal are. They might, if they have a very good season, finish sixth. And then what do they do? All right. <laughs> well, I think that's fair enough, and I'm glad to hear that. But I have to say, yeah, I mean, Arsenal did look better than they have in the rest of the season. But, you know, one game doesn't make a swallow or a summer or whatever the expression is. But that doesn't take away from the sort of nasty taste in the mouth that you and I felt when they signed William because of all those redundancies and that still hasn't gone away has it I'm still not happy about that you know if it had been my team I'd want them to have ambition but I wouldn't want them to be laying off members of staff yeah I mean the, the groundsman did a, um, a series of, of interviews during last week saying trying to say oh the, the redundancies are nothing to do with us blah 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 and, and the players who took a pay cut have got no right to complain about this well I, I think he's very lucky because in America we're seeing we're seeing player power in in the NBA, the NFL, the Ice Hockey League, and in baseball, which which is very, very unionised, and uh, in the uh, in baseball where the the players uh, have got a very uh, active union, we're seeing protests against owners and against the league. It would be interesting to see if a similar thing happened in in England. You know, we, we've seen small outbreaks of it but nothing nothing organized and i think that might be a very interesting thing to see whether it would happen or not i don't know um but we shall see certainly in, in america the the unions that negotiate for the players are are much more socially aware than in england yeah, I was going to say, I don't think anything like that will happen in Britain. Um, you know, for the last few years, the, the leaders have, and, and more increasingly, consistently lied to the people, and the people just roll over in bed and continue sleeping. So unlikely that will spread to sport, especially with the players being paid so much and everything. But it's interesting that Arteta said, you know, the players can't complain. Well, they have every right to but uh, we shall see if they take that opportunity. On that scale of things, uh, spending money, obviously one player Arsenal could not possibly afford. Last week on the podcast, you and I debated whether Lionel Messi would flourish under the new manager, Ronald Koeman, whether we thought he would stay or go. As soon as we got home, we read that, having recorded the podcast, we read that Messi put in a transfer request, which neither you or I saw coming. What do you make of that? Because, I mean, when I saw that, the first thing I did was text you to have a look because I was so shocked by it but also it made me very excited just because of the, the content we get for the podcast and also the way it, it shakes everything the world of football up I think my my first reaction was that this was uh, an attempt by him to force Bartem Bartomeu the Barcelona chairman force him out now Bartomeu cannot resign if Bartomeu resigns he will be in prison because Barcelona have breached every banking covenant and, and a number of laws in Spain regarding the level of debt that they've got compared to their assets. Bartomeu has to correct that position and get a lot of money in on transfers. Otherwise, he will go to prison. He won't be the first Barcelona chairman to go to prison. Or the, or the same is equally true of Real Madrid presidents, by the way. But Messi is clearly trying to force him out. I said last week that I didn't think Messi could leave, and one of the reasons was I don't think there's a club, there's certainly no club in Europe that could afford him. Now, by saying afford, it doesn't mean they cannot they could not come up with the 90 million a year to pay him. I think there are a number of clubs, obvious ones we can all think of, where they could. But what they couldn't do is suddenly find the extra 150 million that they need of income to balance them in the financial fair play. And that's the issue. It's not about how much the transfer fee is or how much money they have to pay him. It's can they balance their books with financial fair play? And I don't think any club in Europe can do it. That's tr Yeah, that's true. But one suggestion would be uh, that you get 
get rid of all your players apart from the goalkeeper and sign Messi and just let him win the match on his own because he is that good. You and I were saying he scored a third of all Barcelona's league goals last season. Nearly as many as Burnley in their entirety scored. So he's obviously an asset. He's, I mean, he's the best player in the world. We know all that. How much of a difference do you think he, if, if financial restrictions aside and, you know, possibilities or lack of possibility that a Man City or a Man United could, uh, or even Chelsea, could afford to sign him legally, financial fair play and all that, put that to one side, how much of a difference could he make to one of those teams and where do you think he'd make the biggest difference? Clearly, he'd fit in very well at City, I think. He wouldn't fit in very well at Tottenham under Mourinho. I think I don't think he'd fit in at Liverpool, but where do you think he'd be best? Well, I, I think he'd improve every team in the world. But if you've the reason he wouldn't um, it, it wouldn't work at Liverpool is that a lot of Liverpool's attacks come down that right hand channel, particularly with with Mo Salah, where where he's so good going forward. So they don't really need him there. Um, City, yes, I mean he would be a natural sort of replacement, if you like, for Aguero. Where where City struggle when they don't have Aguero there, but if if they had Messi in the inside right channel then that would be very different for them and to see him joining up with uh, De Bruyne would be would be wonderful to see so you, you just think M- Messi at his best and Barcelona at their best when Messi was there in the inside right channel coming to the left and Iniesta starting from the left and, and coming and crossing it's, so it would be that would be absolutely phenomenal but in, any any team will be much better with him than without him and you know his, his goals record where he scored in, in club terms he scored the same number of goals as Ronaldo who's played 120 matches more you know and then we start getting to assists no one in Spain has got as many assists as Messi so it, he'd be a phenomenal addition to absolutely any team even even Burnley or Stoke or any, you know it, does, it really doesn't matter it really doesn't matter and, and as you say stick a goalie there and him on the pitch and he's still got a good chance of winning yeah I mean obviously if he's playing for Stoke he's playing against lesser opposition and really you could just stick him on his own um, or just have every single Stoke player passing the ball to him and you're guaranteed a win so he'd improve everybody he's 33 and he wants a lot of money and he's earning a lot of money you couldn't sell him on uh, so you're not you know you'd get two or three years great value out of him you'd probably if he's at City you'd probably win the league I think if he went to City we'd all be looking to them to win the league that season but it's a it's a moot point isn't it really I suppose so you think he's going to stay do you think Barcelona will force him to stay because he was supposed to go turn up for training yesterday and he didn't turn up I don't know what that means well, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure his lawyer said to him, by sending this um, this legal letter by by Bureau of Facts, which is it's it's the uh, it's it's the electronic ignition of a recorded delivery letter. So it, it's what how lawyers send recorded delivery letters now. Um, you have said I. I've resigned. I'm not. I'm not employed by you anymore. So therefore, you cannot go because if you go, you'll be saying and and go through your medical, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you're by action saying that you you are still a player. So that that's why he didn't. Um, La Liga were asked, have been asked the question. Obviously, does this release clause for 700 million euros does that actually apply? And La Liga have given the only answer they can possibly give, which is basically to restate the rules. You know, it's there in this contract and. And we cannot register any player's transfer, uh, you know, un- unless it's agreed between the parties, and it's not agreed between the parties. So basically, the league are really saying, look, you've either got to agree it between yourselves, or someone's got to go to court, and the court's got to tell us. But as things stand at the moment, we can't register a transfer. So that's the situation that, that we're in. This 700 million release court clause, obviously, if they did agree that you know he's, he wants to leave, he's going to leave. Whoever buys him won't have to actually pay 700 million. If Neymar is what was it, 220, then somebody could get hold of Messi for 250 maybe but it's the wages so there are clubs that can afford maybe 250 300 million I think what, I mean if Man City just let's theorize again if Man City could afford to pay that 250 million and Barcelona said yes take him because Kerman obviously doesn't like him that much does he the way he's been behaving could City just afford that and how could they persuade do you think they could afford the wages because City have got money yeah af- affording the transfer and affording the wages are, are not the issue the issue is the financial financial fair play rules. Paris Saint-Germain could afford him. Chelsea could afford him. Manchester City could afford him. Manchester United could afford him. But where are they going to get the income that's going to balance the books for financial fair play? Now, it's possible that actually within that question is the answer. So uh, what what is his 90 million wages? How is that made up? How much of that is, is um, you know, m- media driven? 
how much of that is sponsorship and all those sorts of things. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite sure some c- commercial lawyers can, can c- come up with something that in, in the normal course of events which, which could make that work. But 90 million is a huge number, and, and that's going to be difficult. I mean, it's going to be very difficult. I don't think it can be done. The issue, though, for City is why would you want to pay 90 million a year and pay 200 million to get him when you could get Dybala from Juventus for he's worth 100 million you probably get get him for 70 million at the moment and he's all right he's he's messy light if you want to look at it in an, in an insulting way um, he plays in the same position plays exactly the same way he's not quite as good but he's a very good second choice for him and um, 68 goals from 161 matches for Juventus and that includes the season before last where Ronaldo insisted that Dybala didn't play and he came on as substitute for 20 times and didn't score many goals that season. Or you've got Lataro Martinez at Inter, 42 goals from 110. Neither of those two players are strikers. They're not the main goal scorer in either team, but uh, a 40% return goals to matches is extremely good for a creative, creative forward. And Dybala is 26 years old and Martinez is 23. And if I was City, I'd be going for either of those. What does fascinate me is that Messi, Dybala... And Martinez in the inside right position, all Argentinian. Why, do, why does Argentina? Why does Argentina keep producing these fantastic inside forwards? That's a good point. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I like that. Dybala, I think Tottenham were after him, weren't they last year? And uh, there's no surprise there. Why not? Probably a better prospect. You're going to get many, many more years out of him than you would Messi. But Messi is Messi, and there's so much that surrounds him: shirt sales and ticket sales, all image rights. And all those things that come around Messi that would create such a such a media storm and such great interest in Man City or whatever, you can see why there is interest, but realistically we both probably think not going to happen. But where does that leave Barcelona? Because then you've got a striker playing for you next season who's unhappy, already put in a transfer request. And when Coman went, and you said straight away, Coman is not the man for the job. And when he went there, the first person he called was Luis Suarez to say, you're not in my plans. The second person, the second, then considering Messi is the most important player at that club, he was the second person Ronald Koeman called and was told, you will, you are just a team player. You will, you will no longer have your special privileges, whatever they were. I mean, for me, that is not very good man management, is it? You've got your star player who scored a third of your goals and you're, you're putting him in his place. What do you make of that as a management style? Um, well, the, the word I would think of is it's ignorant. And you look at the great managers over the years. Um, look at how Matt Busby managed George Best. Look at how Alex Ferguson managed Cantona. You have to manage people according to who they are and what they do and what they bring to your team. And, you know, these great managers talk about teams. Sometimes that individual gets away with something which others don't because they are so important to the team and you have to manage them in a way that gets the best out of them well I think first of all hiring of Koeman was very provocative I think from Bartomeu because he must have known there's no way that Messi is, is going to like that in fact not, not just Messi but but the team the footballers talk they've got friends all over the place you know they, they start off in the youth team and they, their best friends are the players they play together as, as youth footballers and then you go your different ways in various transfers do you think these players don't know of Koeman's record you know particularly the ones in Spain do they not remember back a couple of years to Valencia and Coman how he nearly got them relegated? You know, the third best team in Spain getting relegated. I mean, it's, just, it's extraordinary. So I, I think it was very provocative by, by Bartomeu. And maybe he his thinking was, OK, if we can get get somebody, you know, really piss Messi off, make, make him want to leave, and somebody comes up with sort of 300 million or something for him, it solves the financial problems at, Bar- at uh, Barcelona. Maybe. But it's not just that there is one, your main player, the one who scores a third of your goals and makes the other, a third of the, the rest of them, because his, his assists, he's miles ahead of, in assists of anyone else in Spain and Europe, in fact. It's not just that. But the, Bartomeu then came out with this list of the untransferables. So everyone else who wasn't on the list thought, hang on a second, they want to get rid of me. So you haven't just got one player who doesn't, you know, he's going to stay but doesn't want to play for them. If they can't get rid of these players, they're going to be there as well expected to play for the team and uh, it's not not the best tactic in transfers to be telling the world actually we don't want this player come and buy him you know do, do you not th- you know do you think the price goes up if you say that or do you think the price might go down i mean it's it's it was chronically inept 
by Bartomeu. And Coleman trying to flex his muscles and say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm bullying Messi. Well, you know, more fool you. Yes, I mean, there's all this talk, isn't there, that we've discussed it about how much influence Messi has at the club, but he's uh, their best player and the world's best player. He's been there since he was 13. He is the one that drags them kicking and screaming to win things. Of course, he has some influence, but certainly he wants to be treated specially or he wants to be listened to. And then to tell all these other players, you know, you're not wanted and Messi's looking at all this going on around him without being consulted. And then being insulted by the new manager who, frankly, as you say, not really won very much. He just leaves leaves a very nasty sort of feeling about the whole club. And all like you say, all those players have now got to play there even though they've been told they're not wanted. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. And uh, quite good for us because it gives us lots to talk about. <laughs> Talking of people who um, have many assists, Jack Grealish was uh, finally called up to the England squad yesterday, but only because of a couple of injuries, including two, or a couple of players pulling out, including Marcus Rashford. Southgate said that he didn't pick Grealish initially because there were too many good players in the position he plays him, he wants to play him in, which is sort of on the left wing, isn't it? On the left wing far forward, which Grealish plays further back. But he played for Villa, who nearly went down. Seven goals and 11 assists, I think, this season gone why wasn't he picked initially I can't believe it we've all been clamouring for it and screaming for it and none of us can understand why Grealish hasn't been uh, picked but now he has he's really got to in the match coming up on Saturday next Tuesday he's got to make his mark hasn't he what Southgate said is just simply untrue Grealish is not a forward he, he's an attacking midfield player he plays he sta- his starting position is is in a, a a, a deep inside left position exactly where Iniesta used to play and so to say to compare him to Rashford and all these other players that he compared him to it's just false it's just dishonest because he, that's not his position now the, the, the reason the reason for him saying that is that Southgate doesn't want to admit what he's actually doing which is trying to copy Liverpool because Liverpool don't have that creative passing dribbling midfielder all their creativity comes from the fullbacks left and right fullbacks getting forward and th- they by by winning the ball as high up the pitch as they possibly can, this counter pressing, they they win the ball near their opponent's penalty area, and then you don't necessarily need this this passing genius or dribbling genius to get you to that position. So Southgate is trying to copy what Liverpool do, which I don't think is going to succeed because you know the the players that make it work aren't all English players. <laughs> If you haven't watched much of Grealish and you can cast your memory back, Gascoigne, they're, they're so similar in how they play and what they do. Are you telling me you wouldn't want Gascoigne in the England team now? Of course you would. But that's how Grealish plays. And the people criticise him and say, oh, well, he goes down too easily. You know, the, st- the statistics prove he was the most fouled player in the Premier League last season. He, th- he has lumps kicked out of him and he keeps getting up and keeps delivering. Only De Bruyne had more assists than him in the league this year. And he played for team that was nearly relegated and should have been relegated, in fact. But no, that's another issue. No, I, I think Southgate is treating Grealish incredibly badly and I can't quite understand why. I think it's interesting what you said there about Grealish being the most foul player in the league. I think I'd want that player in an international team because by rights that means that you're going to win plenty of free kicks and possibly penalties so get him on the pitch the com- comparison to Gascoigne I'm not sure Jeff I'm not sure he certainly I don't think can take free kicks like Gascoigne I think that's probably missing from his repertoire but however I think the rest of it yeah probably probably he's that player and he certainly should be in the England team let's uh, have a little look at some transfers that have been happening Tottenham have signed Doherty from Wolverhampton Wanderers which I for 15 million what great business that is Levy we've now signed three players and it isn't even the last day of the transfer <laughs> transfer uh, window very strange I don't know what's happening at Tottenham pinch me wake me up um, what do you make of uh, Doherty then I think Doc- Doherty's shown himself to be a very good player he's, he, he belongs in the Premier League he's not going to make massive mistakes for you but equally he's you know he's not not an inspiring signing but he, he's he's good in the position he plays in M- Mourinho's obviously identified that as a weakness and solved it so good that's what that's what managers should do yes it definitely was a weak spot of ours among others. Chelsea, on the other hand, <laughs> have stormed the transfer window. They've signed more than anybody else. Ben Chilwell. Now, what I've noticed is Leicester, uh, among, there are some clubs that do this. Leicester, and I think Bournemouth have been, uh, not guilty, but have done this as well uh, over the years, but Leicester seem to sell one of their best players every season. Barry Maguire, for example, who we'll come on to later. They seem to sell one of their best players every season, make a lot of money, 
regroup and then do quite well the next season. And Leicester have done that consistently. But with Chelsea, what do you make of these signings? Because I think I think I'm a little, as a top four contender supporter, I'm a little bit worried about Chelsea now because I think they could be challenging for first place now with some of the signings they've got. Yeah, I mean, I I have to say I, I I've been saying for a month that I couldn't understand why they wanted or needed uh, Kai Havertz. Now, not because Kai Havertz isn't a great player, because he really, really is. He's uh, scored 46 goals in 150 appearances. He's the youngest uh, the youngest player to play in the Bundesliga, the youngest to get to 50 games, the youngest to get to 100 games. Broken every goal-scoring record for, for his age. He's 46 goals in 150 appearances compared to De Bruyne, 36 from the same. OK, he plays a little bit further forward. He's an attacking midfield player, but he is absolutely brilliant. A top team should buy him because he's just an amazing player. If I was if I was Mason Mount, I'd be extremely worried because I'm not going to get much game time now because they play in exactly the same position. But Havertz is a is a step up from Mason Mount, definitely. They've got Timo Werner, who's a proven proven centre-forward goal scorer. Ben Chilwell is a great buy. I mean, he's only 23 years old, remember. And yeah, Leicester, they sold Chilwell this year, Maguire last year, Mares the year before, Kante the year before that. And all of those players, you think, oh, they couldn't replace them, but they've replaced every single one. And in certainly in the case of Maguire, with better players, a better player. But So yeah, the, uh, somebody really ought to be looking at Leicester's, Leicester's scouting and saying where do they keep getting these players from because they keep keep doing it they're doing very well I think the key buy for, for Chelsea in defence is Thiago Silva who comes on a free he's 35 so you might say oh he's too old but if you looked at him in the Champions League final he was one of the best players on the pitch and as long as he's fit enough then I don't see why he can't you know can't do very very well for the next two or three years and if you want to rebuild a defence having someone of his experience in there Find yourself a really good, uh, really good number six, and let Thiago Silva teach him. It would be it would be exactly the same as when um, Carvalho came in under Mourinho to teach John Terry how to be a centre back. That's what that's what Lampard is trying to do. And okay, he solved left back. Chilwell, no problem. Solved left back. As for at right back, there still isn't a better right back as a right back in the league than Aspilicueta. TA squared is better going forwards, but Aspilicueta is a better defender. So if you can solve the centre of that defence, maybe bring Declan Rice in as a holder. You've definitely got a team that can challenge for the top position, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I'm a little bit worried about that. We've spoken about Chelsea and their defensive woes, and you've said it's always the goalkeeper that's been at fault. I think, I agree, yeah, Chelsea look like they're forming quite a strong defensive unit there, and, and Silva will be a great addition to that. So they need a goalkeeper then, maybe. They need to improve in that area, and they will be a force to reckon with, I think. Yeah, the issue, of course, is that, you know, they spent £72 million on uh, Ariza Belaga, and ha- have just shown that they don't think he's worth it, so... Who knows how much money they can get from him? Pieter Cech is, has started the the marketing offensive by by saying that he thinks our keeper Ariza Belaga is a is a great goalkeeper. Well, okay, if you think he's a great goalkeeper, play him and let him prove it. But Chelsea have made a couple of bids for the for the Ren goalkeeper Edouard Mendy. They're going to get him for about twenty million, I think. I'm not convinced about that, but yeah, if if. Peter Cech says he's good enough, and then I'm, I'm not going to not going to argue with him. Obviously, Chelsea are looking good. I mean, Hakim Ziyech out of that great Ajax side at 35 million. That's pretty good. He's again, he's a, a fetcher and carrier in midfield, but 96 goals in 280 games, one in three. That's pretty good. Uh, Chilwell, Timo Werner, Thiago Silva, Kai Havertz. That's gonna, that's going to be a very good team. It is, yeah, definitely. That that was the point that uh, we were making. There is Chelsea are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Another team that's looking to improve of course is Manchester United still not managing to sign Jadon Sancho that drama that soap opera rolls on they did make a good signing yesterday for just uh, 40 million euros which is of course less in pounds so a very very good deal for Van de Beek from Ajax who was brilliant uh, in the semi-final against Tottenham last season and of course he's a Netherlands international and he's only 23 I remember last season Jeff, everybody was after him, and I think we know why. Oh, yeah. I mean, as a, a box-to-box midfielder, getting 36 goals from 156 games, so same sort of ratio as Frank Lampard. He's a very, very good good buy for, for Manchester United, and a, a significant step up from Paul Pulper as well, I'd have to say. Yeah, he, I mean, he hasn't scored as many goals as, as Kai Havertz, but Havertz plays further forward than he does. I think it's an exceptionally good buy by Manchester United. He's going, really going to improve that team. 
Yes, and for once, Manchester United haven't overpaid for a player. In fact, I think €40 million Euros for Van der Beek is a bargain, actually, if you look at how much they paid for Pogba, for Maguire. And as you say, uh, I think, yes, he's probably a, a step up from Pogba. Should Pogba be worried now? They're not exactly the same position, but very, very similar. Possibly Pogba should be worried. Uh, they've got, a, yeah, an upgrade. Oh, definitely an upgrade, yeah. I mean, Pogba is, he's averaged six goals per, per season. And seven assists per season. You know, that's that's a long, long way behind uh, Van der Beek or Hakim Ziyech. So th- that great midfield of that, that Ajax side from last season that got to the semi-final of the Champions League and very unlucky not, not to make the final... De Jong, De Beek, and Ziyech have now all gone. So maybe the you know along with Leicester, people should start looking at where where are Ajax getting their players from because those are three. You know, that midfield was absolutely fantastic, and they destroyed everybody they played against. Just. Tottenham got lucky but they've all gone now it will be really really interesting to see De Beek at Manchester United I think that's a great signing and and Ziyech at Chelsea too it'd be great to see them in the Premier League OK well we've got the Premier League starting in uh, just under two weeks so in next week's podcast we'll be talking about that but before we do and I'm sure uh, it will be a controversy that will roll on and on we spoke last week about Harry Maguire being arrested in Greece inspiring J.K. Rawlings to write a new book Harry Maguire and the Prisoner of of Mykonos. However, he's still going on, Jeff, and he's, he's still saying all the wrong things and doing the wrong things. Should he have just let it lie and accept his, his punishment? Uh, because, you know, he's not very good in defence, is he? Yeah, very good. No, he's not very good in defence. And, and he's making it worse. The policeman who is involved in the arrest of Maguire has, has said that... Uh, they treated Maguire the same as they would any other drunk Briton. And let's face it, they do get a lot of experience of this. Maguire has subsequently said he feared he was being abducted when plainclothes officers arrested him. Defender also insisted after the fact that two Albanian men had injected his 20-year-old sister with a drug. Well, OK, um, quite how that happens, I don't really know. And, and most of these um, date-rate drugs are, are given through drink, not injection. Anyway, one of the officers involved told the newspapers there was no mention of Albanians and nothing about his sister when we arrested him. This is a story that's come out afterwards, which is why it was not allowed in the court. What was allowed as evidence in the court was what was said to the police and was written down. So, again, Maguire and his legal team are at fault there, and they're trying to to bounce the whole thing through the newspapers. The the policeman went on to say... Uh, that issue was never raised. We didn't treat him differently to any other drunk British guys. Every time he opens his mouth, he lies. This was just a drunk guy getting in a fight. We deal with it a lot, OK? And then he finishes off with by saying, why would eight police surround him and not identify themselves? We'd lose our jobs. So I think it's very, very clear what's happening there. Yes, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Maguire being punished and uh, still standing up for himself or still coming up with... I mean, the whole thing is you can tell when somebody's telling a lies because they keep embellishing and adding bits as they go along. The nearer and nearer they get to being find out, found out, the more they add stuff. And he's adding this stuff about his sister and being injected and they're Albanians and all. Too much detail, too late. It's all a little bit strange and I think possibly he should just shut up now. Yeah, he should just uh, hold his hand up say it's a fair cop gov society's to blame and, and, and you know and just 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 kill it then if he just admits it says very sorry i behave very badly apologizes to everyone it's about one day's worth of newspapers the following day and then it's done he's he's the one who's dragging this out and he's the one making himself look worse and worse yeah i mean the whole thing is he's got an ideal opportunity to kill it off first of all by just never mentioning it again and he's very very lucky that possibly probably at least the first i don't know eight ten games of the premier league will be played behind closed doors with no fans because of this whole corona rubbish thing that's going on. There'll be no fans there to chant at him or give him abuse and by the time they do get back in the stadiums it will have been forgotten unless of course he keeps it going which is what he's doing. And, and remember uh, Southgate looks has been made to look very stupid, very silly by putting Maguire into the England squad but he did so because he spoke to Maguire and Maguire assured him there was no truth in the, the charges against him. So 
now, you know, Maguire has made Southgate look very stupid. The solution to that problem was Maguire behaves like a man, stands up and says, look, I don't think I should be in the squad. I've got to devote time to the defence of this and, uh, you know, we'll let the England manager concentrate on the football. But he didn't do that. He lied to the to Southgate and made Southgate look stupid. You mentioned there, of course, England, and we're going to have our predictions for England against Iceland and Denmark against England, which are both coming up before the next podcast in just a moment. But it bears mentioning that the, 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 the Premier League hasn't started yet, but the F- Play Cup preliminary preliminary rounds are already started. Oh, pre-preliminary actually. I start whatever that means. I don't know how you, how you can have pre-first, but however that's what they're called. Between between the seventh and the ninth tier of English football, which means that for sure your village is playing. <laughs> if they've got eleven men in the village, you will be playing this week. But today I think there are 154 FA Cup games, so we're going to give our predictions for each one now. Uh, no, we won't do that. But it is quite exciting in a strange way because Jeff and I had a quick look didn't we at some of the names of the teams and there are a lot of lovely little towns that we both knew towns that you'll have never heard of but each one has a football team and it's a good thing isn't it? Well it's a great thing and and the thing that people forget is that all these hundreds in fact thousands of clubs are what make up the FA you know the FA is not this thing looking after the top of the game it's looking after the whole game all the way to the bottom so Uckfield against Haywards Heath is actually you know this is a derby match this is an important game you know I think this is where people should go and watch these games because this is football this is what it's really all about and actually you can go and watch these games because they are one of the few sporting events that you can go and watch now most of these clubs get you know between two and three hundred watching them every week but it is brilliant yeah you've got you've got Ilford against Halstead and then you've got Darlington Red Star I mean they're all just little tiny little teams but who are regularly supported and it's a great thing Um, and that is the magic of the FA Cup and as you say the whole point of the FA really so good luck to all those 154 so that's what 308 teams playing just today and there are other games coming up so the FA Cup started now we've got an international break before (laughs) one week or less than one week before the Premier League starts first of all I don't think that's a good idea I really don't we've got a game on Saturday then on Tuesday, then the Premier League on Saturday. However, England against Iceland, we've slipped up against them before. I'm predicting England 2, Iceland 0. I'll say 2-1 to England. I think Iceland will score. Oh, no, no, hang on a second. Maguire won't be playing, will he? So, um, no, no, it's 2-0. Yeah. <laughs> So we won't be giving the goal away because one of our players has been put away. Um, possibly. And then England are away, I think, at Denmark. I think we'll get at least a draw there. But we've got he's put a lot of young players in the team, to give him credit for that, even though sometimes not the right ones. I think we'll get at least a draw away at Denmark. I'll go for a 2-1 away win. I think we'll beat Denmark away. Excellent. Let's hope so. Those are our predictions for the internationals. Next week's podcast, we will be discussing the start of the Premier League. That all starts on the 12th of September. Before we say our goodbyes, Jeff's trivia question question and the answer. Okay, the the question was, has a club ever built a statue in tribute to somebody who has never played for them or managed them? And this this is a football person, not some random person from the universe. Now, uh, there are two that I know of. One I think most people will guess is Jack Walker, who is the owner of Blackburn. His his boy town team who he, he made a lot of money, came back, bought the club, invested a lot of money and they won the Premier League with Kenny Dalglish as the manager. Yeah. So there's now a statue of Jack Walker outside Ewood Park and and very well deserved. The second one is Derek Dooley. Now, Derek Dooley played uh, for Sheffield Wednesday. He scored more than a goal of a game in his time with Sheffield Wednesday. He went on to become their manager and he was very cruelly sacked on Christmas Eve 1973. So do you think there's a statue of Derek Dooley outside Sheffield Wednesday? You would hope so. Yeah, no, there isn't. Uh, <laughs> he left He left Sheffield Wednesday being, after being sacked on Christmas Eve and he went to United. That is, the, the real United, Sheffield United. And he had a vo- variety of roles, commercial manager, director, chairman of the board. He's the only person who's connected with both who had a standing ovation at Hillsborough. Both sets of supporters stood up to to give him a standing ovation. The statue of Derek Dooley is outside Bramall Lane. So the Blades recognised what he'd done for them, and Sheffield Wednesday didn't. So there you go. That's quite extraordinary, because he was the, he was the most prolific goal scorer. He was also a manager of Wednesday, so he played for them, he managed them. He was then commercial director uh, at Sheffield United and got recognised for his efforts as commercial director enough to get a statue built for him. 
quite weird, very weird. But so Sheffield United doing a lot more for a, obviously a great person there for uh, for the city, I suppose. Yeah, I mean the reason that Dooley's uh, career was cut short at Sheffield Wednesday as a player was um, he had a fracture in his leg, it got gangrene, and they had to amputate his leg. So that's why he stopped being a player. And he was a successful manager for Sheffield Wednesday. But you'd think their highest ever goal scorer would would warrant <laughs> some sort of recognition from them. Instead, it's the city rivals who recognised what he'd done for them and rewarded him accordingly. Fantastic, Jeff. Wonderful. That's all we've got time for. We'll be back next week. I'm Chris Carl. And I'm Jeff Saunders. And that was Hitting the Bar, the football podcast.